night, open to the book of Numbers chapter 7. We're going to get back to our verse by verse, chapter by chapter study through the book of Numbers. Father, thank you for your word and pray that your spirit would just take hold of our lives. We honor you and thank you for pouring your heart through your word and your spirit that stirs us up. So we want to hear from your heart tonight as we look to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned that in the Hebrew Bible, this book is not called Numbers. It's called In the Wilderness, a very appropriate name for it because it describes the events that take place while Israel is in the, the desert those 40 years. And uh, when we get to chapter 7, it kind of takes us back just a little bit to where we were before in the book of Exodus in the sense that they are uh, still there at Mount Sinai. They have not moved yet. And God has been preparing them, instructing them for uh, the, like, how the Levites will uh, function. He's talked about how they will camp east, west, north, and south, different camps and all this. So when we get now to chapter 7, uh, he's talking about the, the offerings that the uh, people are going to bring to uh, make this tabernacle dedicated unto the Lord. We've been talking about building the tabernacle there. That tabernacle is the place where the glory of God is going to dwell. And it's going to be right in the center of the camp. I just love the picture of that because it represents for us the presence of God in our lives. You know, it's a theme of the Bible. There are several themes that run all the way through. One of the themes is the desire of God to be Emmanuel. That name means God with us. That's the heart of the Lord. That's the very reason he sent his son, to be Emmanuel, to make a way for people like you and me sinners like you and me to have a relationship with the holy righteous God the holy righteous God actually wants now to me this is amazing right the holy righteous God actually wants relationships to people like you and me now to me that's amazing because he's holy and righteous and we're not we're, we're like sinners well we are sinners we're not just like sinners we are sinners and and so that's an amazing thing that God would actually want. He wants you as a son or a daughter to the point that he would pursue. That's amazing that he would send his own son to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sin that we might receive the righteousness of God and have a relationship to him. That's amazing. And so it's part of that picture for us. The tabernacle of God dwells amongst men. You know, it's a theme that runs from the Bible all the way through. From Genesis, where Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening. You can run all the way to Revelation, where he talks about the new heaven and the new earth. And the fact that there will be a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it says that there, there will be no need for the tabernacle there because God himself will dwell amongst his people. And there will be no need even for the light of the sun because the glory of God will illuminate. I don't know about you, but that's fascinating to me. Very powerful picture. And it's all ca captured in the idea that the tabernacle is going to be right in the center, right in the midst of the camp of Israel. So now they're ready to dedicate it. And so the leaders are going to bring this offering to dedicate. All right, so chapter 7 starts out. It came about on the day that Moses finished setting up the tabernacle that he anointed it, he consecrated it with its furnishings and the altar and the utensils. He anointed them and he consecrated them also. And every one of the aspects of this tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, every aspect of it, every part of it shows us Jesus Christ. But then it says something interesting because he's going to now make a provision for the tabernacle to be moved. Wherever they're going to go, it needs to be set up and taken down. And so they've made this provision. Notice this. So then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their father's household, they made an offering. Now, these were the leaders of the tribes. They were the ones who were over the numbered men. 
when they brought their offering before the Lord, they brought also six covered carts and 12 oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders and an ox for each one. Then they presented them before the tabernacle. So this is a provision so the Levites, when they're getting ready to take the tabernacle down, the posts, you know, the pillars, the, the, the materials, all of the, uh, all of the materials are going to be put on carts and be taken with oxen. So this is the provision. Verse 4, then the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, accept these things from them, that they may be used in the service of the tent of meeting, that's the tabernacle, and you shall give them to the Levites, to each man according to his service. So Moses took the carts and the oxen, and he gave them to the Levites. Two carts, four oxen, he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. Four carts, eight oxen, he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service. They had more to carry, heavier things. Uh, under the direction of Ethamar, the son of Aaron the priest, but he did not give any to the sons of Kohath because theirs was the service of the holy things, the holy objects. Now, this is a beautiful part here, which they carried on their shoulder. Now, you might say, well, that's, they had to carry these things on their shoulder. I mean, that was going to get some heavy, you know, after a while, but there was quite a few of them. They took turns. But the holy things the holiest of holy things. Those things are not to be carried on carts, taken by oxen. No, they are to be on men. And this is, the, this is a picture. The presence of the living God is not to be on carts, it's to be on men. I, there's something beautiful here, right? It's about you. It's about the heart of God. I want it to be carried in the hearts of men. The holiest things are yours. The holiest of holy things that God gives to you. Do you know the scripture says that we, the church, have the privilege of coming into the nearness, even the nearest place with God. And it says that we can even come in with confidence. That's amazing. That we sinners can enter into the holiest of holiest of holiest of holy places and be invited by God. And we can stand there in front of the throne of God with confidence and call God even our Papa, our Abba Father. There's something glorious about what God is saying here. I want it carried in the hearts or on the men. All right. So then the leaders, verse 10, offered the dedication offering for the altar when it was anointed. So the leaders offered their offering before the altar. Then the Lord said to Moses, let them present their offering one liter each day for the dedication of the altar. Okay, so there's going to be 12 days where one leader is going to bring uh, such from his own family, his own tribe of people, or they're going to bring their offering. Okay, so it's going to list them in detail and by name. The leaders are going to come. They're going to make a big presentation. Here, the first day, see verse 12, the one who presented his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. First one, first tribe. And his offering was this. So he was going to bring a silver platter, silver dish. Weight was 130 shekels. One silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. This is several pounds weight. And both of them filled with fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. Then one gold pan of 10 shekels full of incense, full of incense. One bull, one ram, one male lamb for a, a year old for the burn offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, five male lambs, one year old. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Aminadab. It lists them out in great detail. Now, what's interesting is that's day one. Day two, the next leader comes. Second day is Nethanel, the son of Zuar, leader of Issachar. He presented his offering. What's interesting is exactly the same. 130 shekels of the platter, silver bowl, 70. Uh, exactly, exactly, exactly the same. So instead of reading all of it, because it goes through every single one of these 
every single day and they're exactly the same, would you permit me to say to you they're exactly the same? All right, thank you very much. I will take note of their names because they do mean something. And, you know, I can just see, you know, it would be a grand presentation. You know, it really meant something to them. It's a grand presentation. I want to give this. This is the dedication of the tabernacle of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. I want to do something. I want to make this glorious. So it would be a grand presentation. And all the family would assemble, right, and, and, and make it really a glorious thing. Now, it's not for their own glory, because not one was better than the other. They're all the same. But it was so that the Lord would be honored from each tribe by name, right? So the second was from the tribe of Issachar. The third, Zebulun. The fourth day, it was Reuben. The fifth day, it was uh, uh, Simeon. The sixth day, it was Gad. The seventh day, uh, uh, the grain offering was Elashima of Ephraim. Eighth day, Gamaliel of Manasseh. Ninth day, Abaddon from Benjamin. Tenth day, Ahizer from Dan. Eleventh day was Pagiel uh, from Asher. And the twelfth day was Ahira from Naphtali. That was 78 verses, my friends. 78 verses right there. Verse 84, this was the dedication offering for the altar from the leaders of Israel when it was anointed. And now it's going to give us the sum. Twelve silver dishes, twelve silver bowls, twelve gold pans, each silver dish weighing 130 shekels, each bowl weighing 70. The silver of the utensils was 2,400 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and twelve gold pans full of incense. Weighing 10 shekels apiece, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, all the gold of the pans, 120 shekels. All the oxen for the burnt offering, 12 bulls, rams, 12, and list all of them uh, in detail. Then it says, verse 60, this was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. Now, when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. So he spoke to him. The Lord would speak to Moses there in that tabernacle. He could hear his, his voice. And it's just a picture of the, of the relationship that God and Moses had. I love what it said in Exodus 33 where it says that, God would speak to Moses face to face like a man would speak to his friend. And there's a picture of that for us because the Lord Jesus says, I call you friends. And I've invited you to come into a place where you can come and talk with God. Now, you may not hear his audible voice such as this. God was giving him clear instruction. But the Holy Spirit will minister to you. You know, oftentimes prayer for a lot of people is just asking for God to do stuff for them. God, I need you to do this for me. And this is, their, this is their prayer. When they get in trouble, they ask, you know, they go and ask God for help. But don't you think that there is something beautiful that God wants us to have in our relationship to him where we just simply be in the presence of the Lord and something beautiful happens there. Something glorious happens there. You know, the... the Disciples noticed something about Jesus. It says that he often would get away by himself and just pray. Just be by himself. And just pray. And the disciples, they knew, they could see that there was an amazing relationship that Jesus had with his father. And they could see that it was connected to his praying. They could see that. They knew that. It was connected somehow to his praying. And that's why they came to him one time and they said, Sir, Lord, teach us to pray. We want that. Teach us to pray. Because we want that kind of relationship to God. And we're clearly seeing you praying. And therefore, we know that prayer is an important part of that. Would you teach us how to do that? Now, to me, that's beautiful. And, I, and I, I really am praying that there would be a hunger and a thirst in this church 
for everyone in this room to want that very thing. I want their Lord. I want that. I want there to be in me something of the nearness and the intimacy and the beauty of drawing into a relationship. And I know that prayer is part of it. So I want to know, I want to know what it means to pray like that. Anybody else? Would you raise your hand if you would say the same thing like that as I would say? I want to know that. I want to have that. See, it's important because we live, you know, I tell you what, we live in such a, a hectic, fast pace. Everything's available now at the touch of a button. And it, it's so easy to lose the intimacy of the Lord in this time that we're living. Don't you agree? It's so easy to lose the intimacy of the Lord. But the intimacy of the Lord is where you're going to find strength. They knew that. They could see that in the Lord. It's there. It's in the quietness of the soul that the Spirit begins to revive the soul. It's not in the hectic. See, it's, it, oftentimes we think, oh, I'm going I'm to pull myself up by my bootstraps, you know. I'm going to just work, and I'm going to work, and I'm just going to really pour myself out, and I'm going to get myself successful. God would say, ha, you'll get as far as your own strength. You'll get as far as your own strength. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go as far as my own strength. I want to go farther than that. I want to go where God and God alone can take me. Anybody else? I want God and God alone to be the strength of my heart and the strength of my life. So I love that picture. Uh, may we desire it. All right, chapter 8. Then the Lord said this to Moses. Now speak to Aaron and to his sons. Uh, Aaron and say to him, now when you mount the lamps, the seven lamps, which will give light in front of the lampstand, Aaron therefore did so. He mounted its lamps at the front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moses. This was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold. The gold of the lampstands must be beaten gold. Kind of pictures for us, you know. The fact that he suffered in our behalf to be the light of the world, to be the light in us. Beaten work of gold from its base to its flowers. It was hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord showed Moses. So he made the lampstand. You know, in the tabernacle, there was no light. There was no natural light. You know, the sun did not shine in it. Because it was completely covered in the curtain, right? The tabernacle was completely dark if it was not for the lampstand that brought that light. And it's, and it's glorious because I tell you, you could do a study throughout the scriptures of the lampstand and all that it sig signifies and means. And you can understand that the oil of the lamp is the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The glory of God illumines the temple. The glory of God is that fire. And there's that picture in all of us of the fact that he is the light that ignites the soul to the point that he says... Now you be the light of the world. See, this is a very important. You could do a whole study on this. It's like it in Zechariah, where, where he was given an image of this lampstand. And then the, the oil of the olive tree actually was fed right into the lampstands. And the, the angel said to him, do you know what these mean? And he said, you do, sir. I have a great answer. You do, sir. And he said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, the governor. This is the word of the Lord. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I mean, you, you got to say that with some thunder to your voice. Because there, there's, there's power to what he just said there. Do you know what this is? You know, sir. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? See, when Israel come back from the exile, you know, they came back to a destroyed Jerusalem. And literally a mountain of rubble. The temple had been destroyed. The city had been destroyed. A mountain of rubble. Oh, they were so discouraged. Look at this mountain of rubble. Look at these problems. 
We can never overcome. We can never do this. And the people became so downhearted and so distraught and so discouraged. And then this vision came. Do you know what this is? You know, sir. Yeah, this is the word of the Lord. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. It's by my Holy Spirit. What are you, O great mountain? Before it's a rubble bull, you will become a plain. And he will put the top stone with shouts of grace. Grace to it, he will say. Oh, it's glorious. It's a powerful picture for us. All right. So he then says, now, verse 5 of the same chapter. Now, again, the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, take the Levites from among the sons of Israel and cleanse them. They're going to be prepared for the serving uh, of, the, of the Lord. The Levites are the one tribe out of all the tribes that are given the honor and the privilege of serving God himself and representing the people in doing so. So now you're going to cleanse them. If you're going to do the work of God, going to be clean. So you shall this, do this to them, verse 7, the cleansing, sprinkle, purifying water. Now remember, now remember, okay, they're in the desert. It's hot. They be uh, sweating. And they didn't have regular showers like you and I have the privilege of having regular showers. It is a blessing to have a regular shower. Not just to myself, but to the people around me. <laughs> it is a blessing to have a shower. Can you imagine what, okay, let's just be open here. Can you imagine what they smelled like? in the desert, right? No air conditioning, it's hot, it's sweaty. They don't have regular showers and they didn't have deodorant. I'm saying it was manly. <laughs> it is manly, manly, manly. Anybody with me on this? You're gonna come into the work of the Lord, you're gonna take a bath. You're gonna get clean, that's what he said. Which I think is a, it's right, right? But now a picture something, doesn't it picture? You know when we, we just did baptism last week, and I mentioned that the water represents many things. One thing it represents is death and yet resurrection because, you, you know, you always take them out of the water. But, which is, you know, helpful. But it also represents washing, the washing of water. It's a picture of the washing of our own sins. We, we, we are sinners and he washes washes them away. So it's a picture, isn't it, of that very thing. You're going to come to the Lord? Now, here's the thing. Do to them this. See, sprinkle this on them. It's important to recognize because no man comes to God and says, I washed, I cleansed, I did my own work of cleansing my life. You know, I got my act together. I did this. No one can say that to the Lord because there is none righteous, no, not one. The righteousness, you want to call it for what it is, he says the righteousness of man is like filthy rags. This is the work that God does. Our part is to desire it. God, this is your work. And I have to recognize that I am in great need. Now, you know when you come to Jesus Christ, and there's that picture of baptism. Your sins are washed away. Yet nevertheless, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful truth. Then we must have the practical aspect of the fact that we still live in this messy world. We still live in a dirty, dirt-filled world, do we not? And when you live in a dirt-filled world, you're gonna get dirt just walking in this world. But also we have to recognize that we're not, we're not perfect in the practical living out of our lives. There's still the need for the Lord to do a work, a regular work. We don't, we need to come to the Lord and say, God, I come to you and ask that the things of my life need to be washed pure and clean again. I take my heart to you and say, God, please forgive, please wash, please renew. Isn't there a part of us that needs that regularly? Anybody else want to be honest? Isn't that a regular thing of what we knew? Please renew me, Lord. Please wash. You've made the provision. I'm asking. 
please make me new. So he says, sprinkle them with water, let them use a razor over their body, wash their clothes, let them be clean. Then take a bull with the grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, then a second bull for a sin offering. It's a recognition of what it costs. See, one is the practical, one is the price. What was the price of our forgiveness? Came at great cost. Came at the cost of the Son of the living God. The blood that was poured out is the highest price. So you shall present the Levites before the tent of meeting. Now notice this, it's interesting. Then gather the whole assembly of the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. Then you present the Levites before the Lord, and then the sons of Israel are to lay their hands on the Levites. Now that's an interesting scene. So all the, the whole congregation comes, and the, the Levites are there, and they lay their hands. You know, the laying on of hands is, is a very important picture in Scripture. What does it represent? It represents transfer. Transfer. Something is transferred in the laying on of hands. This is, this is a very important key. So that the Levites now are going to represent. Right? So there's a laying on of hands. But notice, continue. So you present them, and then, the verse 10, the sons of Israel lay their hands on the Levites. Now Aaron then, then shall present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering. You know, they had various uh, offerings where they would wave the offering before the Lord. They would wave the offering before the Lord. And they would be saying to the Lord, this is yours. I give this to you. This is a wave offering. I give it to you. The Levites are to be presented as a wave offering. I'm not sure exactly what that would look like. Maybe it looked like, you know, maybe they're just standing before the Lord. Maybe they're like doing this, you know. Or maybe they're doing this. I mean, I don't know. But they are presented as given to the Lord. Do it as an offering unto the Lord. It's a beautiful picture. They're going to serve the Lord now. What a privilege it is. What a privilege it is to serve the king. To be asked to serve the king. It's a glorious picture, isn't it? To do it for him. Do you know what the scripture says? Because it says something similar to about you and me. In, in Romans chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. He's talking about you here and me. Be transformed. God has a business to do. He's got a work of transforming you and me. That's what he's about. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. This is your spiritual service of worship. This is you worshiping. When you, when you just honor the Lord in your life, that's worship. That's worship. I was thinking about this the other day. I, I don't know, I was just having a moment, I guess. And I just, I just felt real sensitive and tender, like I wanted to cry, kind of. And I was saying, Lord, this is who I am, me. As a pastor, it's a privilege. I gotta tell you what a privilege it is to teach God's word, it is a privilege to serve, I was praying with somebody who had been sent home, hospice will be called, nothing more we can do, to sit with them, pray with them, remember glorious things that God had done, the glorious things that yet awaited. This is, this, is my, this is my worship, God. I'm worshiping you in this. To visit someone having a, up to five bypass surgery, open heart, all day long surgery. Been monitoring it all day. Praying for him. This is my worship, Lord. 
this is my worship. I love this. I love this. This is, this is for you, Lord. This is, this is for you. I do it to you, Lord. It's my worship. Last night, I was driving home. We were at the worship gathering last night, and uh, I had a via with me in the car. We were, I don't know, when you're in the presence of the Lord, I guess it makes you kind of sensitive. We were talking, and uh, she's, she brought up her mom. You know, her mom was murdered five years ago. She brought up her mom, and she says, I was talking to someone who said that my mom could talk to you about anything. Is that true? And I said, yeah. We were very, very close. And I said, she used, to, she used to say I was her rock. Just something she said. What does it mean? It means that she knew I would always be there. She knew I would always love her. She knew that I would always be for her. That she can come to me with anything. She knew that. And I said, so when I'm raising you now, I'm doing it because I'm honoring my daughter and I'm honoring my God and you are a blessing to me. Amen? I'm doing it for you, Lord. This is my worship. This is my worship. This is who I am. See, there's a part of us that God wants all of us to have a desire. I want to do, I want to live, I want to honor you. There's something inside of me that just wants to honor you. This is important because we, we, we get so caught up in all the busy things of life. I tell you something, all of the busy things of life don't really matter. In the big picture of things, how much do they really matter? Really? whether you have an Android or an iPhone, does it really matter? The big picture is what God is doing in the soul. That's what matters, because that's eternal. That's, that is heaven tasted now. That's eternal. That's what life's about. And I pray that we would all have a sense that we are called to do something and he calls us, in fact, the scripture says, do you know what you are? You are called the kingdom of priests. And you can have the honor of privilege of doing something for the Lord. Isn't there a desire in your heart? Isn't there something in your heart that says, God, I want to, I want to honor you in my life in some way. It's a beautiful picture of this very thing. So then he says, now, the Levites, verse 12, are to lay their hands on the head of the bulls. Ah, again, there's a transfer. To lay their hands on the head of the bulls is to transfer the sins onto that bull that's gonna die instead of them. And there's that picture for us because that transfer, we don't, we don't put our hands on the head of a bull. That is completely not needed anymore. Now, we, you might say we've laid our hands on the son of the living God. Our sins have been transferred to the son who paid for it all. But did you know something interesting? He also puts his hand on you. There's a transfer from him to you. What is that transfer? That transfer, this is amazing. You put your hands on the Lord. Your sins are transferred from you to him. And he pays it all. What's the transfer? When he puts his hand on you, what comes to you? The righteousness of God. He gives to you the very righteousness of God. He lays his hand on you and he transfers to you, transfers to you the very righteousness of God as a gift. See, I'm trying to, I'm trying to emphasize it so you're amazed at it. God wants you to be amazed at that. That's, um, that's glorious. And that is something to honor him for. And if you recognize it, if you can open your eyes to it, it will, it will cause you to want to honor him. 
and to live according to that which he gave you. I'm going to give you this gift. I'm going to give you that righteousness. I'm going to give you that holiness. Now live by that. Now live by that. Because it will bless your life. This will bless your life. I love you, and I want to bless your life. All right. So they laid their hands on the bulls. And uh, there's verse 13, you shall have the Levites then stand before Aaron and before the sons, so as to present them as a wave offering to the Lord. Verse 14, thus you shall separate the Levites from among the sons of Israel. The Levites are mine. Then after that, the Levites may go in to serve at the tent of meeting, but you shall cleanse them and present them as a wave offering first, for they are holy given to me. From among the sons of Israel, I have taken them for myself. Instead of every first issue of the womb, the firstborn of the sons of Israel. Remember, I take Levites because the firstborn are mine, he says. I have called every firstborn mine. Remember what he, in fact, he says it. Verse 17, every firstborn among the sons of Israel is mine. Among the men and among the animals, on the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. But I have taken the Levites instead of every firstborn among the sons of Israel. There's some really deep things there, which we discussed when we were there before. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the sons of Israel to perform the work of the sons of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement on behalf of the sons of Israel. So there may be no plague among Israel by their coming near to the sanctuary. See, I've made a way for the sons of Israel to come near to the presence of the living God. That's what I've done. Thus uh, uh, did Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the sons of Israel to the Levites, according to all that Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so the sons of Israel did to them. The Levites, too, they purified themselves from sin, washed their clothes. Aaron presented them as a wave offering before the Lord. Aaron made atonement for them to cleanse them. Then after that, the Levites went in to perform their service in the tent of meeting before Aaron and his sons as the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so they did to it. Now, verse 23, now the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, this is what applies to the Levites from 25 years old and upward. Everything I've said, from 25 years old, that's when they begin the work of service uh, and to perform the work in the tent of meeting. But at the age of 50, they shall retire from service in the work and not work anymore. Can we just stop right there? That is a glorious verse to camp on. But we shall not stop there. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to stop. When I get 50, I don't want to stop. I'm 50 again and again and again and again and again. And, you know, here's the thing. You know, I was just talking to the elders about this, a, I don't know, a couple months ago. There is nothing in me that wants to stop. Amen. There is nothing in me that wants to stop. I just want to, God, give me the strength to keep going until this church gets tired of me. A amen? Because you know, you might get tired of me. You never know. But Lord, I want to keep going. So notice this though. Verse 26, they may, however, assist their brothers in the tent of meeting. They get to keep going if they want to, to keep an obligation. But they themselves do no work in the tent. Thus you shall deal with the Levites concerning their obligations. Chapter 9. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they came out of the land of Egypt. Okay, first month of the second year. You might know that there's things that happen in the first month of the year. So what are some of those things? Passover. Every first month of the year, Passover. Let the sons of Israel observe the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month, at twilight, you shall observe it at its appointed time. You shall observe it according to all its statutes and according to all its ordinances. So Moses told the sons of Israel, we're going to do the Passover. 
So they observed the Passover in the first month. On the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord had commanded, so the sons of Israel did it. But there were some men who were unclean because of a dead person. They had to take care of this. This was an obligation of the family. So they could not observe the Passover on that day. So they came to Moses and Aaron and they said, and these men said, Though we are unclean because of the dead person, why are we restrained from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the sons of Israel? Which is to say, we really want to do this. We want to, we really want to do this. Why can't we do it? I don't know about you, there's something really beautiful about this heart. There's something that's very much like a Christian who says, I really want, I want to worship. I want to, I want to study God's word. I want to, I want to. There's a part of me that just really hungers for it. I remember some years ago, uh, we had a really bad winter and uh, we had to like cancel two weekends of services, right? And, and there's just something like in me, just like chomping at the bit, right? Uh, we got to do church. That's, we missed two weeks or just something. And then I was talking to people uh, who were like feeling the same thing. This doesn't feel right. We got to do church, right? Okay, so now, of course, now with modern technology, we have a whole different thing. Now when the, when the snows hit, you know, or the ice, we still do church. We just do it all online. You're supposed to be amazed. Wow. <laughs> Wow, I know, it's awesome. Okay, so, hey, we want to do this. Why can't we do it? So Moses, verse 8, said, okay, wait. And I will listen to what the Lord will command concerning you. I like that too. I don't know. Let's ask the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, and he said this. Now speak to the sons of Israel. If any one of you or your generations, in other words, that come after, becomes unclean because of a dead person, or is on a distant journey, he may observe the Passover of the Lord. But notice, in the second month, let him go through and become clean. And then in the second month, on the 14th day at twilight, he shall observe it. Eat it with unleavened bread, bitter herbs, all the same things. Do it just as you would. They shall leave none of it till morning, nor break a bone of it. According to the statute of the Passover, they shall observe it. But the man who is clean and not on a journey and yet neglects to do it, I really don't want to. I frankly don't want to. That person shall be cut off from his people. He did not present the offering of the Lord at its appointed time. This man is going to bear his own sin. And if an alien sojourns among you and observes the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to its ordinance, he shall do it. Whether it's a foreigner or a stranger, it doesn't matter. You have one statute, both for the alien and the native. Notice that verse, though. The one who doesn't want to, he's going to bear his own sin. Now, that's interesting because you know that Passover is one of the most powerful pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, you might know this, but Jesus actually died at the Passover, at the time of the Passover. And Jesus having that supper with the disciples said this cup is the cup of the new covenant initiated in my blood. Take and drink and remember my death. The Passover, the picture is so powerfully Jesus. And the cup is the cup of the new covenant initiated in his blood because when you partake of that cup, it's a picture of you partaking of the blood of the Passover. You remember, right? In Egypt, when, they, when the word of the Lord came, take the blood of an unblemished lamb with hyssop and sprinkle it on the doorposts and the lentil of the house, which, by the way, forms a cross. Enter in through that blood. Enter through that blood into that house, and then you are saved from the condemnation of death. 
And it's a picture of the fact that the blood of Christ is given to you. When you partake of it, you are, it's a picture of you partaking of the blood. And when his blood is applied, it's like his death is applied. And the payment has been made. The payment has been made. The payment for sin has been paid in full, gloriously paid in full. Here's the thing. There's only two choices. Either your sin is carried by Jesus on the cross and paid in full, or it's carried by you. There's only two choices. There's only two choices. Either it's paid by Jesus on the cross or it's carried by you. There's only two choices. And that's why he says, the one who, re who will not do it is going to carry his own sin. He's made a provision. You say, well, that's kind of a strong word. No, it's a provision. God has sent his son, his only begotten son, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. It's because of love. Didn't he start that verse by saying, God loved the world so much that he did this for you? It was for love. He made this amazing provision. And so therefore, tonight, may we make sure that that blood has been applied to your life. Father, thank you so much for this word that you pour out by your spirit. And I pray for everyone in this room tonight that we would recognize that you have made it possible for sinners to have their sins paid in full. You have sent your son to die on the cross and we can transfer our sins to that son when he died, he paid it all. Church tonight, I want to give you this invitation. If you would tonight ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to take that blood which is applied to your life in the forgiveness of sin, if you would open your heart, if you would ask Jesus even tonight, I'm asking that you would forgive my sin because the blood of Jesus has paid for it all. I'm asking that you take that blood and apply it to my life, that I would be truly forgiven. And God, then would you give to me that gift of holiness, righteousness that you give. I want that. I'm asking for that. Church tonight, if you would ask God for these things tonight, open your heart to him. Would you just raise your hand to the Lord? I say, yes, God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Many hands. God bless you. Father, thank you. May you truly truly pour your life, your spirit, your forgiveness, be glorified as we come to you seeking, wanting, desiring that work of God in our lives. We want that work of God. We want you by your Holy Spirit to ignite us, ignite our soul and do a work of transforming us. We want the beauty of your presence and we want a life that honors you. We want to live a life that honors you. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor tonight? Amen.